Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you this morning, Lord, and we declare uh, you are faithful. Uh, God, we are here praising you because you are faithful, God. You're faithful to your promises old. You're faithful to your promises present. And you will be faithful to the end, Lord. God, we thank you that even when we are unfaithful, you are still faithful. As we come before you this morning, God, we ask that you would just continue to lead us through your presence, Lord. As we open your word this morning, Lord, teach us, Father, your ways. God, we may we embrace your faithfulness more and more each and every day. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Awesome. You guys can go and grab a seat. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. You guys enjoying your summer? Enjoying the heat? Yes? My wife and I, we got to go uh, camping up at Albion this last week. Well, it wasn't really what I would call camping. Uh, growing up, my, my picture of camping was tent, dirt, and uh, being in the woods with wild animals. Um, but this, this was uh, quite a different experience. We had cabins, a little kitchen, and a bed, and... It was, it was absolutely wonderful, and uh, my, I'm still getting used to the, the Mendocino Coast area and just the coast area here and uh, just all the different uh, beautiful, you know, places that are accessible here, and, um, you know, we got to go up in, uh, in Albion, and uh, there's a little river that goes to the ocean. We got to go kayaking and catch some crabs with the kids, and um, it, was, it was just a lot of fun, and uh, I'm going to tell a story about how much of an ogre I am. Actually, my wife is going to laugh at me. Um, see, I think I'm like this nimble guy, like I'm, you know, lying on my toes and, you know, I, I'm, I can get around pretty quickly, but uh, she's always you know, telling me about how I'm always, uh, you know, hurting people because I don't realize how big I am. And uh, the classic thing happened this last week as we were camping. Uh, you know, I saw this little chipmunk that was hiding under this tarp by our room. And I thought to myself, man, I got to catch this chipmunk. The kids will be so pumped on seeing a chipmunk. And so this chipmunk goes under this tarp, and I pounce. And I'm thinking I'm going to get this thing. And lo and behold, as I finally get the tarp up, the chipmunk was no longer alive. And I killed a chipmunk. And my heart was just so devastated. And my wife's just laughing at me like, you are just an ogre. I cannot believe you killed a harmless little chipmunk. Well, that was my week. Um, actually, the story has nothing to do with where we're going this morning. Um, but uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing our series in, in this uh, Game Changers theme and, and how we embrace the revolutionary aspects of who Jesus is in our life and how as we come encounter who Jesus is, he calls us into a radical new way of living. And uh, I can't think, I can think of a lot of experiences in my own life and how God has really challenged me in this. And this morning we're going to be talking about sacrifice versus comfort. And, uh, you know, for me that's something that's been a, a, something I've wrestled with a lot in my life. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like to be comfortable. It's easy to be comfortable. That's what we kind of, you know, kind of gravitate towards. We don't gravitate towards discomfort. We gravitate towards comfort. And for me in my own walk with the Lord, um, you know, I, I grew up in a family where my dad was, an, uh, you know, a high-ranking Navy man. He was in the Navy for 35 years, and we always had stability. You know, we had a good income. We had a nice house. And, and, and so for me, I grew up in a household where it's like, hey, these are the things that you pursue after. Uh, you build your life around the American dream, Right? Uh, you go after the career that pays good money, has good benefits, uh, you do well for yourself, you establish yourself, you get nice cars, you get the house, and you build kind of like your little empire. And then you'll be comfortable, then you'll be happy, and, and you'll have all your toys and all of your things, and, and that's kind of like the American dream, isn't it? And for me, um, when I came to the Lord, uh, I felt like early on God was calling me into ministry, uh, and I ran from it, and I began to pursue a career in firefighting. Uh, which I thought was going to bring me uh, what I wanted and what the good life and the comfortable life or the, the life that I thought that I needed to pursue after. You know, I looked at this career and for me said, hey, firefighters get paid great money. Uh, they, they have great benefits. It's a great job. Uh, you get to work 10 days out of the month. Who wouldn't want to do those things, right? You get to do a lot of really cool stuff. And so I was pursuing, for me, a life of comfort, 
That, that's what my goal and my heart was pursuing after. And so as I pursued this, I, there was this discontentment in my own life because I finally came to a place where I realized like, hey, I'm trying to pursue this career and this picture of life and bring God alongside of me in this and saying, okay, this is where the Lord's leading me. And I actually wasn't being led by the Lord. And for me, I came to this place where I was like, hey, I don't want to quit. I don't want to give up. What will people think of me if I were to actually start living for what God was calling me to and pursuing the life that he wanted me to? I thought about my dad. My dad laughed at me when I told him that I wanted to pursue ministry and hang up this pursuit of this career. What are you going to do? How are you going to pay for your food? How are you going to live, right? But I knew for me that it was worth it. I had to sacrifice what I thought was most comfortable and worth pursuing in my life to follow what I felt like God was calling me to and into, and I didn't care. At the end of the day, the very thing that I thought would make me comfortable made me actually discomfortable or uncomfortable. And so as I gave up the pursuit of that vision for my life and embraced what it was that God was calling me into and sacrificed myself, sacrificed my agenda, sacrificed what I thought that I wanted, I actually found myself more comforted than I had ever found myself in anything that I was pursuing after. Because my pursuit of comfort had been my ultimate thing and it wasn't until that I made God my ultimate thing and began to pursue after him that I was truly comforted in that. Nothing else mattered. It didn't matter that I had, didn't have the things of the world or pursuing after the things of the world and what I thought was right because I had God. And that whether I had those things or not, I was good. I had peace in that. And as we look at Jesus and we, as we look at how he teaches his disciples about the, the kingdom of God and, and what the ultimate thing is and what the values and behaviors look like in his kingdom, we see that it is, it is the very same thing, that it is not the pursuit of a life of comfort. In fact, it is a life that is marked by sacrifice instead of a marked by comfort. But that doesn't mean that you won't be comforted. In fact, that as you pursue after Jesus, as you live for him, as you sacrifice yourself, as you give of yourself to him and to others, the very thing that you're desiring deep down inside of your heart, that missing component that we in humanity have lacked from the garden on is filled with the one thing that can actually bring true contentment and peace in this world, which is Christ himself. So would you turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Verse 20 through 36. Luke chapter 6, verse 20 through 36. And he lifted up his eyes on the disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. 
But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Now as we look uh, at Luke's gospel, we find ourselves in chapter 6 in the the heart of Jesus' teaching. And as he's been teaching, he's been teaching about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is like. He's declared the good news of the gospel and it's come in himself as the Messiah, the Son of God. And he declares this message of good news. And he brings this message of good news to the people of his day. And part of his mission in expressing that good news and that gospel was to lay out what the kingdom of God looks like. That there is this kingdom, that there's a society and a world of humanity that exists, but the kingdom of God is wholly different than the kingdom of the world. And as the kingdom of God comes to the earth, as it comes in the form of Jesus Christ, he lays out how just different the kingdom of God is. That it has a different set of values, that it has a different mission, that it has a different purpose, that it has different behaviors and ethics than the world does. And so in chapter 6, we find ourselves here, Jesus teaching about just how different that kingdom is. Just how polar opposite in terms of its values, its ethics, and behavior is. And we see it through different attitudes in verses 20 through 26. And so Jesus, in these attitudes, he compares and he contrasts two different sets of values. The first one we read here tells us, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And then in verse 24, he says, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Now what's crucial to understanding this blessing and this woe as they're contrasted to each other is this idea of poor and rich. Throughout the Gospel of Luke, poor not only refers to those who are in a socioeconomic status, but those who are marginalized, those who are on the fringe, those who are lacking from the normal social status quos that others might have who are in higher standing. And so we see it's both economic and it's social. And as we turn to the rich, this understanding is along similar lines, that Those who are proud and mighty throughout Luke are contrasted as those who are rich. Those who are hungry or without hunger uh, were rich. Those who had resources at their disposal, those who enjoyed relationships of equality and mutuality were considered rich in the Gospel of Luke. Those who enjoyed such relationships and such life, those were the people who were rich. And so like the poor, rich is not simply this declaration of economic class. It's related fundamentally to these issues of values and that these values are rooted in power. These values are rooted in privilege, social location as an insider, and also finding self-assurance in monetary wealth, security apart from God, setting oneself up in the place or the position of God. And so we see that there's these totally different paradigms between the social and the economic of the rich and the poor. And so Jesus is radically overturning these terms. And he says, hey, you know what? The one who is in fact blessed isn't the one that everybody thinks is blessed. Even in ancient times, the idea was that if you had wealth, if you had power, if you had economic status, and if you were in good standing within the public and you were accepted, then God had blessed you that you were the one that was blessed. And Jesus turns that on his head and says, in fact, it's the poor, it's the marginalized, it's the people on the fringe, the people who are hurting, the people who are accepted, unaccepted in society, the people who are lacking, those are the ones who are blessed, in fact. Why? Because the kingdom of God belongs to them. It was the rich that didn't think they necessarily needed God. They often had self-reliance. They put more confidence in stock in themselves and, than trusting in God. And oftentimes we see this in Jesus' ministry, don't we? 
That it's those who reject God are those who are arrogant, that are proud, and don't think they need him in the first place. And those who receive Jesus Christ, those who embrace who he is as the Messiah, are those who are aware of their brokenness. They're aware of their poorness. They're aware of their need for God in their lives. And we see that here, Jesus said, Bless, blessed are those who are poor. Secondly, we see a contrast in verses 21 and 25 again. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. And then in verse 25, woe to you who are fully now, full now, for you shall be hungry. Here again, Jesus contrasts these two different ideas of hunger and satisfaction. In the first pair, as he teaches that those who are hungry now will be blessed in the future because they will be satisfied with something more than just what they have that is temporal and that is earthly. And the idea here of fullness is those who are sustained. That even in the midst of their hunger now, even in the present situation, they are still sustained in the moment, but also how much more in the future. But those who are putting their reliance and their trust and their confidence in what they have now in food in the present, those are the ones who will not be comforted because they will no longer have the satisfaction that they have now. Again, because the fullness of their confidence in what they're living for and what they're looking for is being met in their bellies, but it is missing in their heart. The third pair in verse 21 and 25, or sorry, the third pair. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And then in verse 25, woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. This idea of laughter uh, in the ancient times was considered haughtiness or a boasting or, or a pridefulness. But those who weep and mourn, those were people who were seen as people who were repentant, people who were, who were aware of their brokenness, aware of their need and crying out to God. And so we see this contrast between the two, that those who are actually looking to God and, and mourning in the midst of what they recognize as their brokenness and sin, they will be comforted by God. They, in fact, will laugh in the future day and that they will be in a place of joy. Why? Because they will have exactly what they have been crying out for. That in the midst of the morning, in the midst of their recognizing their brokenness, that as they look to God, they have that for all of eternity. But those who laugh and have a, a boastful heart, they will mourn on that day. Those who took confidence and, and scoffed at God and, and had haughtiness and said, hey, you know, I don't need God. I don't need to turn to him. I stand on my own two feet. Their laughter will be turned to mourning. And so the humble will be lifted up and the prideful will be brought low in God's kingdom. And again, we see Jesus elevating these different values of the kingdom. That it's, that it's the humble that will be blessed. It is those who are sustained by God that will be blessed. Those who put their faith in him and trust in him. It is those who depend on God for all that they need and that they look towards him as their sense of authority they are the ones that are lifted up. But it is those who find authority, power, and strength in themselves that will be brought low. And this, this really flies in the face of culture and humanity, doesn't it? I mean, when we look at society and we look at the world around us, these are all the powers of, of, of socioeconomic status that we try to use to accomplish our purposes and plans in this world. That's why we have politics that's why people use their influence through money, through power, through sexuality, whatever they can use to accomplish their agenda. But here, Jesus is flipping all that on its head and he's saying, hey, all these social economic things and relational things that people find confidence and take power in, they are, in fact, the things that we shouldn't be looking toward, the values that we should be pursuing to find strength in. That it's actually in the reverse order. And we see this fully in verses 22 and 23, contrasted with verse 26. Where here Jesus says this, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. 
And then he goes on in verse 26, Woe to you when people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. You see what Jesus is getting at here? He's saying, blessed is the one who aligns with the Son of Man. Blessed is that one because people will hate you when you align with him. Jesus, in fact, told his disciples, they will hate you because they hated me first. See, when we take upon ourselves the vision and the ethics of God's kingdom, we stand in opposition to the world. And the world, like darkness that Jesus mentions, does not like the light. It will beat against it. It will rebuff it. And Jesus says, blessed are you when you find yourself in that position. Why? Because you're aligning yourself with the brokenhearted. You're aligning yourself with those who mourn. You're aligning yourself with those who are marginalized. You're putting yourself in the place of the poor person by aligning yourself with God. When you hold to his values, when you hold to his ethics, when you say, you know what, it is not society, it is not culture, it is not academia, it is not the world that dictates what my sense of right and wrong in the world is, and what I see that I should be living for, but it's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He changes us in such a profound way that we look different, and that difference will cause problems in the world. That difference will be sacrificial. And you will feel the weight of that. And there's a false notion, I think, oftentimes in the world that if, if we come to Jesus and if we put our trust and our faith in him, then everything's gonna be great. There's just gonna be rainbows and ponies. I'm gonna get whatever I want, right? This, this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that if you put your faith in Jesus and everything is gonna go great your way. And Jesus is telling us here, That's the exact opposite of the truth. The truth is is that as you follow Jesus, as you follow the way of Christ, as you take upon yourself his values, you look different and the world doesn't like it and you should expect it. You should expect it that when you follow Jesus that you might get rebuffed. You should expect it when you follow Jesus that you might have to encounter some hard situations and some hard circumstances because the world has different values, and it's diametrically opposed to the values of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus lays down this this picture of reality. This is what I love about Jesus, is he constantly is, is giving us a picture of what truth is, of what reality is. And so he does this in laying down these values through the attitudes, or what we know as the Beatitudes. But then he goes on from there to give us a picture of, okay, if this is reality, if the world is in fact upside down and the kingdom of God is right side up, then our behaviors should look different. That if this is the reality of God, how we live, how we engage, how we interact with the world and the people around us should look differently according to this reality. And so he goes on in verse 27 through 36 to talk about our behaviors as disciples and how we are to love that love looks different as a result of the values of Jesus. And so, Jesus unpacks this in these verses. And he tells his disciples to love their enemies, to do good to those who oppose them, to bless those who curse them, and to pray for those who abuse him. Think about that. That's a radical kind of behavior love, right? We're talking about a love that does not look like the world right here. And oftentimes, unfortunately, doesn't even look like in our church, does it? That should not be the case, and that's why Jesus gets to the heart of the matter here. He calls calls his followers to form a community which has boundaries that are porous, which primary behavior is a refusal to treat others as if they were enemies. At its core, Jesus rejects balanced reciprocity. The idea of do to others as they have done, as they do to you, Jesus says, no, no, no. Do to others as you would want them to do to you. He rejects the life of obligation and debt that is characteristic of the principles of the world. And he calls his disciples to put off these claims of honor and status, to take away things like interest on loans, and to bear the burden of others. 
this open-handed sort of sharing, this type of sharing that we see in family oftentimes, right? If somebody were in your family and said, hey, I need to borrow a buck, you just give it to them. Or I need five bucks. Or hey, I need to borrow this. Or I need to borrow this. There's this open-handedness that you hold with your family. But here, Jesus is saying, hey, that kind of open-handedness that you have in your family, do to others that same thing. That even not only the others, but the enemy of yourself. He takes it further. And so how is it that Jesus can urge his disciples or, in fact, command his disciples to live in such a radical way, to love others in such a radical way? It's rooted and it's grounded in the very character of God and his love and what he has shown. What does Jesus say in verse 35 and 36? He says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your heavenly Father is merciful. What is this radical kind of self-giving love rooted in? The love for enemies? Of giving your tunic or giving your clothes or what is it, whatever it is that God calls you to in that moment? It's rooted in who God is. We give and we are generous with our lives because God is. You see what Jesus is saying here? Scripture tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies of God, he gave his life for us. We are that enemy. We are that person. We are in that situation. We are in that circumstance. And here is a declaration of the gospel. That if we are to receive the great mercy of the Most High God, if we are to embrace his grace and his kindness, that should do something different in our lives. It should do something different by the way that we love. God demonstrated his love in this way and he calls his disciples to go and do likewise. This series we're talking about game changers and we're, how God calls us into areas that really are radical. They, they're really life-changing, aren't they? And today we're talking about sacrifice versus comfort. And how easy it is for us to get up pursuing, to get into the rut of pursuing a life of comfort. Especially here in the United States, right? Uh, we want something to eat. We've got a plethora of decisions and choices around us. We need food. We run to the grocery store, right? If we're hot, if we've got air conditioning, you flip on the air conditioning. Uh, we have a lot of things around us to make us uncomfortable. But the kingdom of God... It requires us, if we are to follow the way of Jesus, it requires us to step into a life of sacrifice. If we are to live out the values of Jesus Christ, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us earthly comfort at times. It's going to require us to put trust and faith not in ourselves, but in God. It will require dying to our own pride, by humbling ourselves, by embracing a new way of living. It will require identifying with the marginalized, embracing the impressed, loving the unlovely. It will mean giving your life up, your hopes up, your dreams up to God and saying, God, you know what? You know my heart, you know all of me, but I'm yours. And that takes sacrifice. That takes dying to ourselves. That takes putting ourselves before God and saying, you know what, Lord, I am denying myself. I'm denying my fleshly desires. I'm denying the things and the comforts of the world and saying, God, you take me. I'm yours. And when we follow him where he goes, and when we align ourselves with his mission and purpose in this world, it will require sacrifice in our lives. His values become our values. His purposes, our purposes. And because of these things, you will experience discomfort in this world. However, it doesn't mean that we won't be comforted. See, Augustine famously once said, our hearts are restless 
until they rest in thee. See, the ultimate picture here that we see is this, is that in striving for comfort, we're striving for something greater, aren't we? In striving for a life of comfort, we're, we're making that our ultimate thing because there's something inside of us apart from God that is restless. There's something inside of us that is there's wanting to fill our hearts with something that will bring true rest and comfort. But ultimately, as we pursue after comfort as an ultimate thing, it always leads us wanting for more, doesn't it? Doesn't matter how good of a job you have, how nice of a car you have, how many friends you have, how nice of a house, whatever it might be, even when you get it, you're still not satisfied. You're truly not comforted in those things. And here's the picture and the reality that we see that is when we stop pursuing comfort to fill the discomfort in us and we start pursuing God as the only thing that can fill us and meet that place of discomfort, only then are we truly comforted. Because those things that we want to place as ultimate things can never meet that place. He can only meet that place. And when he is in his rightful place, even when we have those things or don't have those things, we're always comforted. And that is the thing that even Paul gets at, where he talks about whether I'm in need or want, I am content. Why? Because those things at the end of the day, they don't matter. They don't. Whether we have them or not, whether you have the career or the job or the relationships or not, at the end of the day, when those things are not your ultimate thing and he is your ultimate thing, you are always comforted because you have him. And this is the message of God, the gospel. That when you come to him as that place, as you embrace God, and receive him as your Lord and as your Savior and the good news of who he is. And if you sacrifice yourself, you die to yourself and you say, Lord, my life is yours now. I put my trust, my hope in you. Then everything that we deep down are longing after is met in him. Because the ultimate thing is put in its rightful place. And that's the good news of Jesus, isn't it? Blessed are those who are poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They've already got it. See, the beautiful thing about that is that's in the present tense. It's not the future tense of what they will inherit because if they embrace the kingdom of God now, they have heaven on earth now. The very thing that they're desiring for all of eternity, we have now. The kingdom of God is not just something that we look for in the future. It is something that we have in the present. And that's because Jesus Christ has died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He came from the grave and he is alive. He's not dead. We're not worshiping a God that was living thousands of years ago and it's a great story. We're worshiping and living for the living God. And because he is real and because he meets that place of brokenness, he, needs, he meets that place within us that needs to be comforted. No matter what we have in this world, no matter how much we experience suffering or how much we have to sacrifice ourselves, Nothing can ever take away the great comfort that we have in him. This morning, I'd like to challenge us, those who are believers here, that if you're finding your comfort in other things than God, if you're allowing the comfortable things to become ultimate things, and God isn't your ultimate place of comfort, your ultimate source of where you're living and what you're living for, then maybe God is challenging you to take a step back and reorientate your values. Maybe he's calling you to take a step back and say, you know what? My life has been in the, involved in the pursuit of living a more comfortable life. But God calls me into a life of sacrifice. And I want that. Why? Because I want him. He's got to be the ultimate thing. He can't be number two or number three. And you can't ride the fence you can't have your foot in the world and you can't have your foot living one foot living for Jesus. That's not how it works. He wants all of you, not just part of you. And if you're here this morning and you're thinking about that or you've thought about that before and you haven't made that step and said, you know what, Lord, I want to know what that looks like to pursue after you and have the kingdom of God. I want to see what that kingdom looks like. Lord, I want that. And this morning, we're going to have people up here to, to pray. 
We're going to have people up here to, to talk with you if you need to talk through some stuff. Uh, and we want to give you that opportunity this morning if that's something that you want to decide to do and go after. The second point I want to make this morning, I know you guys are up here, sorry. Second point that I want to make this morning is not only love requires us to sacrifice individually, but it also requires us to sacrifice corporately. This context where Jesus calls his disciples into required great sacrifice from his disciples. He says to love their enemies, to embrace the unlovely, not just to love the people who are easy to love, but to love the people who are hard to love. And that means that there's relational sacrifice that happens in our life. It's easy for us just to culminate and build relationships with people who we naturally are affinitive towards or we have commonalities, right? But I know you can all think about somebody in your life that's not easy to love, right? Whether it's in your workplace, it's the person that always gets on your nerves or has always got a bad attitude. Maybe it's the guy that, you know, down the street from you that, man, you just butt heads all the time, and they're not easy to love. Maybe it's a family member where you're like, man, I don't want anything to do with this person, right? We can all think of those people in our lives, but the kind of radical love that that God is calling us to, the kind of sacrificial love that God is calling us to, is to love the unlovely, to love the enemy, to love the brokenhearted. Why? Because we have an acute awareness of how much God has loved us, because we are that to God. We've been in that position. We were enemies to God, but we have embraced his mercy, his kindness in our lives, his great radical love in our lives, and it frees us to love others in the same way, not expecting anything in return. Just solely out of, this is how much God has loved me, and I want you to experience and know the very same love that I know. Let me show it to you. When you're nasty to me, when you say bad things to me, when you do things to try to undermine me or hurt me, I'm going to love you anyways. I'm just going to pour out kindness upon you. Can you imagine how much God, if every single one of us in this room would change the communities and the lives of the people around us if we loved that kind of way? I think if we want to see a movement in our church, if we want to see a movement in our lives, if we want to see a movement in this city, it has to flow out of this. It has to flow out of this. And it starts with us receiving, first and foremost, allowing ourselves to receive Christ's love for us, to embrace the fullness of his grace and mercy in our lives. Because when we know and understand just how much we are completely loved and accepted by God, it frees us to love and accept others no matter what they bring to the table. And so as a church, as a community, my prayer, as we talk about game changers and living a radical kind of lifestyle, is we start by taking upon ourselves the value and behaviors of Jesus Christ and what he calls us to that we would love like this. I'll tell you what, that's not going to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable, right? Uh, Maybe there's going to be conflict. It's okay. It's okay. The church isn't the people of God coming together perfect as, you know, put together. The church is God's people who are broken coming together, receive his grace and mercy and kindness in our lives. We don't have it all together. And if we allow ourselves to embrace one another and allow room and space for brokenness in this place, I believe as we love one another in the midst of that, God is going to do something amazing. May we embrace his radical, self-giving, comfort-abandoning love, and may we live that out here. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, God, God, I first and foremost just want to thank you. Um, God, that you loved us when we were your enemy. God, thank you for reaching out to us even when we turned our backs against you. Thank you for showing us your mercy and your kindness, Lord. God, I pray that as we respond to you, Lord, individually and as a community, God, 
that you would stir in our hearts, Lord, what your heart looks like and how it behaves. That you would give us the courage, God, to embrace the broken parts of one another. God, that we would have the courage, Lord, to love even when it hurts. That we would have the courage, God, to let go of our comforts and to live for you in a radical kind of way, Lord. A sacrificial way, Lord. A reckless way, Lord. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen.